We are uh, continuing our series about the anatomy of a toxic heart, and one of the things we're looking at today is discontentment. So I've got an illustration here this morning that I'm borrowing. I've seen other preachers do this, but I'm putting a little twist on it. You'll see later. But uh, this morning I want to talk about our desires, because our desires are part of our one of the things that lead to discontentment in our lives. And so we have desires. We we actually have all the same desires, many of us, and one of the desires we have is for time, right? We have a desire for time. We have a desire for what we're going to do with our time. Some of us have desires for how we're going to spend our time. The rest of Sunday, went to church, going to spend the rest of the day. What are you going to spend the rest of the day doing with your time? You have desires. You have plans for that, right? And so those may be good plans or bad plans. I don't know. If watching football is not a bad thing, but it might be a desire you have with your, to use your time doing that. And so we all have time, we all have desires for time and more time, and then we also have a desire to get an education, to get a degree, to, to, to get a job, to get certified, what certification, whatever it is we need to, to create the lifestyle that we desire in our lives. And so we get that degree and we get that education so that we can make some of this, because we desire this, right? We heard about that in Timothy's morning, so we desire some of this. We get this to get to some of this, right? And as, uh, as uh, Doug already pointed out, some of us even played one of these this week, a Powerball ticket, right? Because we desired, to more, we desired more of this, and we weren't getting enough from this, so we bought one of these. <laughs> so we desire that, and so that was a desire that we had within us. And so we had that. And then the other, and the reason we have those desires is because we want one of these, right? You know, we want a special one of these or a certain color one of these or a certain, you know, truck or sports car or whatever it is that we desire. And so we want that. And so we do all those other things to get that because we desire that. And then we get that special someone, right? We desire that special someone in our life that we end up being married to. And so we get married and then we have desires for our spouses, right? We have desires for what they're going to do in the house, either in the house or out of the house. And it could be either way, right? I mean, I know uh, some wives that are better at this than this. And I know husbands that are better at this than this. And so you have these desires and dreams for how your spouse will be one of these two things, right? Or do things in your life. Or you have this dream of how they'll be once you marry them. And so you have those dreams and desires. And then because really what it's about is getting one of these, right? And what, what we have desires. I know you didn't exactly want this color, <laughs> but it's all I could find that would fit in the box, right? So you have a desire for one of these. How big is this going to be? What's it going to look like on the outside? What it's going to look like on the inside? And you desire that. And then you ha may have a desire for one of these, <laughs> or two of these, or five of these, right? And so you have all these desires because you want to fill this, and so you need all this to get this and this and this, right? So we have all these desires at work within us. And that's not necessarily the problem. You know, some of these are very healthy, good desires. There's nothing wrong with some of these desires. The problem comes when we move these desires into another box, and we take our desires, whether healthy or unhealthy, and we move them into another box. And this is the box, when we move them into this box, we start to get discontent. This is where the problems start to arise. And this is where we start to make desires expectations. We have an expectation of how we're going to spend our time this afternoon. What if that expectation doesn't get met? We look for somebody to blame, we look for somebody to argue with, we get frustrated because our desire became an expectation. Or when we don't get one of these, or the job that we wanted, what happened when we made it an expectation, what happens in our hearts? Or think about, where's my other desire? Yeah, you know, if I'm not getting enough of this and I expect a certain amount of this and I'm not getting it, what does that do to our heart? Or maybe, the person I married isn't living up to my expectations in their role as my spouse. What does that do to my relationship to them? Here's what I've discovered in marriage, folks. The more I expect of my spouse, the bigger the problems are. <laughs> but when I start to accept my spouse for who God created her to be, 
things get better. So it's about expectations, isn't it? Or maybe we don't get the exact color. Maybe we're in, we end up with a pink house and it didn't meet our expectations. We might be disappointed or we might be disappointed that we don't have enough of this to buy the size of this that we want. And so we get disappointed. We get discontent because we needed an expectation. Or, you know, uh, you know, I went into a dealership once expecting a truck and I came up with a minivan. And so, <laughs> you know, I wanted the truck and I was discontent with the truck. And then, you know, but even more seriously, what happens when you want many of these and you can't have them for some reason? And that can be hurtful. And that can create anger and frustration and blame uh, against each other in your relationship. Or, you know, you got twins or triplets, you know, or something like that. And it wasn't what you expected, but yet you find there's joy in that. But again, it could become an expectation. Now, notice, though, that if you played one of these, you may not have expected to win, Right? And so when you played this, it was a desire, but because you never moved it into an expectation, other than Doug, we know Doug made an expectation, (laughs) but until we move it into an expectation, when we heard the numbers come out, we weren't really that disappointed. We we went about our day. It didn't ruin our lives. We didn't get frustrated. We didn't blame anybody because we didn't didn't expect to win, and so it just stayed a desire. Can you see how this could create problems? Now, the issue is, is that the problem really is, is this is all in our heart. How many times have we had an expectation for somebody else, but we never communicated it to them? And because we've never communicated, they're like wondering why they're angry with us, why we're frustrated all the time, because we have an expectation that went unmet, that they didn't know they were supposed to meet, whether it's in our job, within our marriage, within our family. It's that expectation that can create the frustration and the anger and the blaming that goes on because we took a desire that may have been healthy or unhealthy and we made it an expectation. And then we end up discontent as a result of that. That's how we get to discontentment. (laughs) We've set ourselves up in our own hearts for those things. This is all going on within us. And as we mentioned last week, Jesus said it's not that what goes into you that makes you unclean, it's what comes out of you. It's what comes out of your heart that makes a person unclean not what goes into you. And remember, our definition of discontentment is, I'm not getting what I want. I'm not getting what I want, my expectations. What I see that I should have, I'm not getting what I want, and that's a heart issue. Now, Paul does a great job of helping illustrate this in his letter to Timothy. And he's talking about one particular desire, not this desire. He's talking about this desire, right? He's talking about the desire for this. And he's using this one desire as an illustration and talking about what it looks like and how it becomes a problem and what the problem it leads to is. The first thing that, one of the things that Paul says to Timothy, who's another pastor in another church, and Paul's writing to Timothy, instructing Timothy about people who want to get wealthy, and he says this, but people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. So the desire, the key desire that's at work here is the longing to be rich. That's a desire. And so how many of us here have a longing to be rich? Don't answer. (laughs) Now, if you played one of these this week, If you bought one of these or were a part of an office pool to buy one of these lottery tickets, Powerball tickets, if you look inside your heart on the purchase of that ticket, you will see one desire motivating this ticket purchase, and that is the longing to be rich. Be honest with yourself. Was it not a longing to be rich that made you buy this? Now, Those of you who didn't buy tickets and think you're off the hook, (laughs) how many of you thought about buying a ticket? How many of you thought about going into that office pool? How many of you just hearing it on the news thought, well, maybe just this one time I could play this? Because, and then as Doug confessed, I love that Doug confessed. Thank you, Doug. He started to think, you know, what could I do? With all that money, 
And what I'm doing as I'm thinking about what I would do with all that money, what am I nurturing? What, what thoughts are being nurtured within me, even though I, don't ever, I didn't buy a ticket, but I can tell you I was thinking about what it would be like if I won. What's going on? What am I stirring up? What's the desire? It's the longing to be rich. And I'm thinking about all the altruistic things, of course, I would do. I would pay off the church's debt. You know, I would give to charity. But in that, if I'm really honest, and if you're really honest with yourself, you were also thinking about a few other things. I was thinking about how I might be able to do some things to this, and how I could finally get my truck instead of my minivan. (laughs) Right? Because then within me is a longing to be rich. Now, The next thing Paul says is that at some point this longing, this desire, moves to another stage. He says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So this longing becomes a love. This this desire becomes an all-consuming expectation. And that's what can lead to frustration, but love of something. How many of you love your kids? Those of you who have kids, how many love your kids, right? What would you do for your kids? You would do anything for them. You would make sacrifices for their well-being. Now, does that, I I hope it also applies to your spouse. If you're married, you will do things. You will make sacrifices for your spouse. If they ask you to do something around the house, you do that for them. You sacrifice for them. You help them in ways around the house, hopefully in their role, because you're willing to sacrifice for them because you love them. That's it, isn't it? We will sacrifice when we love someone. We'll also sacrifice when we love something. How many of us have sacrificed for this? How many of us have sacrificed time for this? How many of us have worked overtime for this, worked longer hours for this, worked even harder to get more in that advancement, that career ladder? How many of us because of this, our love for this, have made sacrifices. So maybe it's moved from a desire to an expectation. And how has that, what's been the result of that? (laughs) What's been the result of all this desiring and longing and loving? Paul says it. He says, and some people craving money. It's not a longing It's not a love, now it's a craving. Have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. The result of this longing and loving and craving leads to our brokenness in our relationship with God. This desire has become an expectation and that expectation in pursuit of it has led us to wander away from God. It has destroyed our relationship to God, is what Paul says. Can you also see how you could take any one of these desires and they could become destructive not only to our relationship with God, but to our relationship to our spouse, to our kids, to our coworkers? Have you ever heard the phrase, he had his heart set on fill in the blank? She had her heart set on fill in the blank. That's an expectation. And when we get our hearts set on those things and people don't meet those expectations or life doesn't meet those expectations, we experience discontentment, we experience disappointment, we experience frustration, and then what do we do? We look for somebody to blame because my life's not going the way I want it to. Remember, discontentment is not getting what I want or expect (laughs) from life or from others. And that can become destructive, but realize that's all going on inside of us. So what do you do? What do you do with those desires and expectations? Because notice, too, that it's all about how we think about things, right? It's our thought life that leads to our heart's condition and vice versa. There's a connection here. So what we need to do and what will help us and what the antidote to the toxicity of this is to develop a a habit of gratitude. To say, I am grateful for what I do have in this box. I thank God for everything in this box, for what I do have rather than what I don't have. Because our culture is so created to create discontentment in us. 
our culture is designed to create discontentment. I mean, now there's nothing wrong with meeting somebody online. That, that's nothing wrong with meeting your spouse online. But if you ever watch an eHarmony commercial, the whole point of that commercial is to create discontentment in your current relationships so that you will seek out this service to help you find the person you expect or the person that you want, right? And so it's not that the online dating is a problem, it's the way they market it. They create discontentment so that you'll buy something, purchase something. That, they, we do this with all the products that we sell in America. Create some discontentment in somebody, show them that they don't only want this, that they now believe they need this, so we move a want to a need. And that's part of what happens to us. And so that creates discontentment. And so we need to have and, and develop an attitude of gratitude. And that's what Paul says next. He says, yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. None of this goes with us. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. It's about seeing that we have enough. So here's what I want to suggest you do with some of your time. I lost my clock. But I'll, let, me, let me ask you to do something different with your time this afternoon. Make a list. Take inventory of your life right now. And in that list, list everything you have. List your house, your home, what's in it, your cars, your spouse or your family members or your close friends. Just list your relational, take a relational inventory, take an inventory of everything you have, take an inventory of food, clothing, possessions, relationships. And then after you look at that list, and I have imagined if you take this seriously, it'll be a long list. Then beside that list, I want you to make another list. And on that list, I want you to put at the top what I need. And then after looking at what you have, start to assess what your real needs are. And there may be some real needs, some legitimate needs, some healthy needs that you have that you might list there. And then start to compare those two lists. And which one's longer? And which one's shorter? And then there's one more list I want you to make. Then make another list of everything you want. And the reason I ask you to do that is because what, I will, what you'll start to see is how often you skip over your real needs to get to your wants. And that's what keeps you in a cycle of discontentment. You already have enough, probably, in a lot of areas. But you skip over your legitimate needs to keep pursuing your wants. And it's those, that pursuit of wants that keeps you in that cycle of accumulating more and more wealth and riches and stuff. Rather than really looking at, God, what do I really need? Do I have enough, and what do I really need? And that creates gratitude. I know that that's another thing that Paul said to us in First Thessalonians. He said, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Notice, if you want to know what God's will for you is, there it is. How, in what circumstances? all circumstances, not some of the time, not some circumstances, all circumstances, whether my desires and expectations are met or not, I'm to be thankful in all circumstances. That's the secret to contentment. Gratitude is the antidote to discontentment. Gratitude. I know that one of the things that changes my heart is prayer. You know, when I pray, it changes me. In fact, when I start to pray about stuff in this box, it changes my heart about it. When I pray for someone who's not meeting one of these expectations, and I start to pray for them, I mean really pray for them, it starts to change the way I think about them. It starts to change my thoughts about them. It starts to change the way I look at the situation when I pray. This week I was praying about uh, the refugee crisis. I was praying about the refugees and how they were in such need and where they were living in these refugee camps or other places. And I, then I began to pray about people who are in captivity or in prison because of no fault of their own. They were, they were innocent, but they were, they were framed in some way and they were misjudged in some way and they were put in a prison, not just around the world, but here in our own country. 
where I prayed about those who were in prison around the world because of their faith and they were being persecuted because of their faith. And I started to pray about these groups of people and there was something that started to happen in my heart as I prayed for others. Gratitude. As I prayed, God gave me a heart of gratitude. Because I was able to get up that day, get in my car, and you know what? To be honest with you, I could have gone anywhere I wanted that day. And I chose on my way to the office to stop and get a cup of coffee. And I could do that because I had the money to do it, something that most people in the world can't do. I had the freedom to do it. I had the money to do it, as simple as that. And I became grateful because of what I already have. And I forgot about everything I wanted. And prayer changes people. And that's why we encourage each each of us to pray. I told you there was a twist to this, right? Did I tell you that? Or have you been waiting for it? Everybody's like, what? Okay, what's he got now? All right. Well, here's the twist. There's another box I didn't tell you about. And it's a box that you may not want to see. Because if you actually do something with this box, it's either going to wreck you or it's going to free you. This box is either going to crush your spirit or it's going to free your spirit. I can tell you that because this is a box that Jesus talked a lot about. And it's a box that Jesus presented to many people as he taught and as he was in ministry. It was a box that he came to. He presented this box to the Pharisees and religious leaders and they rejected this box. And yet there was another woman at a well who accepted this box and she, she experienced freedom. There was another guy who was called a rich young ruler. He had a lot of wealth. He was rich and Jesus presented this box to him and he turned and away from it, and he was disappointed, and he was frustrated, and he walked away from Jesus. There was another rich man named Zacchaeus who Jesus presented this box to, and this box changed his life, and it freed him up. So I know from Jesus' experience that either this box is going to be accepted or rejected, it will be crushing, or it will be freeing. And that's the box of surrender. At some point, we have to take all these expectations and surrender them to God and say, God, I give you all these expectations. I give you all these desires, and I'm going to trust you to meet all my needs. I'm going to surrender all these things to you, to your will, and to your purposes. That's a hard thing to do but freedom comes. Jesus said, if you want to find your life, you got to lose it. If you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. It's the box of surrender. Now, if you're like me, I know what you do. Well, maybe just a few things. Maybe I'll just put a few things in the box of surrender and hold on to some of the other things. It doesn't work. Jesus says you have to lose it all. You have to surrender it all to God and let God meet every need in your life. Amen.